I'm here in Hook Norton in the Cotswolds on a beautiful sunny day. And I'm about to meet Charlie Luxton, who's been a long standing expert for home building and renovating, best known for presenting TV programs like Building the Dream, when he and the cameras follow people building their own home. Well, today, we're going to be turning the cameras around on Charlie because he is building his own home and we're going to be following his build. Hello. Charlie, what on earth attracted you to this beautiful part of the Cotswolds? <laughs> it is glorious. I do, I do like to say that I do ask myself, but uh, it's beautiful, isn't it? It's, uh, it's uh, a wonderful part of the world. It is a wonderful part of the world. So and you live in a very, very traditional cottage. Yes. I wasn't perhaps expecting that. I thought you'd live in something very, very contemporary, having no, seen quite a few of your programmes. I think that's the, the thing that shocks people, is that actually we live in a grade two listed thatched cottage. And it was sort of never meant to be necessarily like that. But it's, it's been wonderful. And we, we've loved living here. We've lived here for 11 years. Um, absolutely adore the house. We did a really sustainable refurbishment to it about eight years ago. Not easy on an old, old Not easy, place. a real learning curve, wood, wool, fibre, limes, you know, um, rainwater harvesting, solar thermal, all, all of the things that were, you know, cutting edge at that time. But it's just too small. You know, we are four and that's 82 square metres, so we are really tight. Um, and when we bought this place 11 years ago, we also bought what was a, a sheep stable, so it was literally full of sheep poo um, and horse tack, a little kind of cart house and then an acre of land just the other side. Yeah, perfect. The house is too small and because this is common land, you can't extend anywhere. So you're really This is in. not your garden. No, no, this, no, is common, this is commonly a, common so land. your bit is that bit there, but My bit this there. bit you have rights to walk over like yes. everybody else, but yes. other people could put their sheep yes. on here or yes. any, anything else. There they are no rights uh, of common, so okay. they can't Strictly speaking, put the sheep there, but yes, they could, in theory, if they wanted to. Not many to. people would buy a property like that, I have to say. If they walk straight out the front door onto common land, yeah, didn't put you off, obviously. No, I think I was uh, stupid and naive, <laughs> to be honest with you, because there's been an, you know, an enormous learning curve. I know a lot about common land now. I imagine you're an the world's awful leading lot expert. about common land. Yeah. Uh, you put up with a lot to live with that. That view is spectacular. Uh, that view just you know, makes me smile every time I come home, and that's what we're fighting for. So the game here. plan is take this all down here yep. and on the land that you do own, not the common land, yep. to build your own home. Exactly. To build a three bedroom house. The two remain as one property. So this will be our guest bedroom and our home office and our office, uh, but we will live over there. And the two are tied, legally tied, with the universal undertaking and all of this kind that of stuff. That is a very unusual situation. Now, does that mean that this is technically an extension or is it a new dwelling? No, it's part of the old house, so it's unfortunately liable for VAT. You know, you do a lot of calculations when you're working out a thing like this, and you go, okay, the VAT's gonna be sort of 80 grand, let's say 90 grand, 80 grand. And then you do the maths of, okay, well, let's move. And then suddenly, well, you've got stamp and you've got moving costs and you've got the, the estate agent's cost to sell the house. And suddenly it's like, well, actually- Half to three quarters of that would have been wiped out Would have been wiped anyway. down anyway. Yeah, okay. So we're at a starting point. So it was like, right, there are loads of people with a big garden or yeah. with a paddock yeah. who'd like to build their own home on it. And yeah. maybe you've had a conversation with the planners and been told you can't build on a paddock or you can't yes. build in your garden, especially in a location like this, which is conservation you know, it looks area. Like, yeah, a conservation yeah. area and it looks like open country. You're not on an area of outstanding natural beauty no, we're as well. No, just though. outside it. Foolishly, we are not in the AOMB, which stops about, about two miles up the road. Actually, we're not even yeah. in the Yeah, and we're not even actually in the Cotswolds, although. People keep saying that we're not actually in the Cotswolds because it's limestone, which is really crucial. So the stone changes into a this redder, orangey stone, and that sort of, in a way, signifies a change out of, out of the Cotswolds. And to me, it does anyway. And the landscape's slightly. I altered. sense you might have been using that in some sort of planning argument. <laughs> I don't know. Well rehearsed but... conversations. Possibly. Sounds like it. So, how on earth have you managed to achieve planning permission here in this location, given that it is? open country, yep. next to a conservation area, yep. next to, you just said, what, grade two listed building? Yeah, grade two listed, yeah. That's a complicated set of planning constraints, yet you have succeeded. Yeah. Is that because you're an architect and you know what we're doing, or is this something other people could manage to do? When we bought the cottage and the stable, the stable was agricultural in use, but crucially, there was a washing machine that had been in there for 15 years, 18 it suggests years. domestic use. It doesn't suggest, it is. It is domestic use. Because the washing machine from the cottage wasn't, so that was actually a laundry. Mm. So therefore it changes the entire use class of that building to be ancillary to the principal dwelling. So when we moved in, we said, look, this is the situation. We've got a certificate of law from this planning permission to say, we want to make this into our home office and guest bedrooms. And in fact, 
We did more than that. We converted that into an annex. We moved out of here. So it's, it's been really complicated. Yeah. But we bought it, we moved in here, we put in a temporary kitchen, we painted everything white, stripped that everything that was old and, and tired and it was, it was freezing cold. We lived there for a year and a half, we did that up. We moved into there, we lived there for a year and a half while we did that. And then we moved back over to here and now we're knocking that down after a gap of about seven or eight years. So cumulatively you'd had at least five years of use of that, well, four years is the significant number of use of that as residential anyway. And prior to that it had been established as residential through use as a laundry, which meant what? It meant that it was part of residential curtilage. Okay, so but, that established the use of the land significantly. Yes. That was the most important part. Yes, which but, meant... but it established the footprint and we could argue that the little bit of concrete in front of it, but they're very keen that the rest of the land is still amenity land and not resident, not garden, which is how it will remain. But the planners were slightly open to the argument that this is our garden. But the planners were quite reasonable. They said, yeah, look, that's, that's an unreasonably small amount of garden. We will allow you a bit of an extension of, of garden to this house. Um, that seems a reasonable thing. And so we then worked with them. Now, the process was lengthy because what we did is we, we drew a very simple scheme and put it in for pre-application advice. Very simple scheme because what you do is you put it out there and they shoot at it and they go, you can't do it for this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason. And we got four pages of no. And then I sat there and just picked off all of those reasons with my planning consultant, with a landscape uh, architect to do landscape impact visual assessments, contamination of soil, wild, like, you name it. You know, You're a man who was not going to take no, no for an answer. Well, Can we go and look, take a look at the plans? Yes. Let's look. Can Let's we look at, look at how the story evolved and yeah. the, the first scheme you put forward, they yes. said no to, the second they put no to, and, and yeah, the four and schemes. Four schemes. Four schemes. But you got there four in the end. Four schemes. Yes. Well, seemingly.